I know I have PTSD. I've been to the doctor. I can clearly see that there's a six in this picture. But what she was trying to do is trying to discredit me. Veterans, what's going on? Phil here with On Your Six Consulting. In this video, I wanted to go over my personal experience in my mental health CNP exam, and we'll also dig into how the VA rates mental health disorders. So trust me, you'll want to stick around for this one. Really, really valuable information. The first thing I want you to do is go to Google. We're going to type in VA Public DBQ. DBQ stands for Disability Benefit Questionnaire. And this is what the actual CNP examiner, when you go to your medical exam, this is the form that they're filling out. They're going to be filling out the a private DBQ, they, so it's going to be very similar, but there'll be some small subtle differences. This is a very good guide to look at beforehand and maybe even fill out or bring it to your own personal doctor and have them fill it out and then bring this to your exam. That way you can follow along and make sure that they're not skipping over stuff. And also something else noteworthy here, if you look at here, they have all these other DBQs. So if you have skin issues, scars, um, ear, nose, and throat, sinusitis, rhinitis, you can look at all these. You can literally download these. They're public use on the VA's website. So this isn't just mental health DBQs. So if any of these, if, if you plan on claiming any of these other ones, consider downloading them and checking them out. We're going to be under psychological. We're going to just go to PTSD review. Click on that. It's going to bring up the actual DBQ. Okay, so here's my personal experience. Whenever you go to these CMP exams, you're going to go in. They're supposed to spend time going through your file before you actually get to your appointment. But let's be honest, a lot of these CMP examiners see veterans back to back all day. They don't have time to thumb through a 1500 page medical file. So go in there and be prepared to have to tell your story, especially if this is your first time filing for that condition. If you're filing for an increase for this condition, they're going to be able to see that it's for an increase. So you shouldn't have to talk about what actually caused your condition to develop. They're going to be honed in on what's changed and how your symptoms have gotten worse to see if they warrant a higher rating. Okay, so DBQ, you're going to sit down there and get some basic information and then they're going to issue you a diagnosis. They have many different methods of doing this. They may have you do a DSM-5 sort of test, a personality test and all that stuff. Or if you already have a diagnosis on file, let's say you go to the VA already, they're going to be able to plug and play your actual diagnosis and the associated ICD code with that. We're, we're talking specifically about PTSD here today, but you can have multiple diagnosis. And something else notable here, you can only be rated for one mental health condition because the VA considers this pyramiding. If, even if you have a diagnosis of, let's say, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and uh, insomnia, you, all, you only have one rating. They can only give you one rating because a lot of the symptoms for each condition tend to overlap. And it's almost impossible to be able to tell, okay, this symptom is because of your PTSD. This other symptom is because of your depression. Uh, but they do give a blank spot here where they can actually fill that stuff out right here. 3B, like I was just talking about, is it possible to differentiate what symptoms are attributable to each diagnosis? And the reason why is you can actually have a separate rating for a TBI, which is a traumatic brain injury, from a mental health disorder because they, they, they do have a little bit different symptoms. But once again, a lot of them overlap. So don't think you're going to get a separate rating. It's possible. And I've, I have seen personal instances of, of a veteran having a separate rating for TBI and PTSD. This is going to be the big one right here. So after they get all this other information from you, they're going to be checking these boxes. This is going to be your biggest one right here. If we look at the 38 CFR rating criteria, you'll notice the first sentence. And I'm looking specifically here at the 70% rating as that is the most common rating for veterans suffering from mental health disorders. Occupational and social impairment with deficiencies in most areas such as work, school, family relations, judgment, thinking, or mood, and then it lists out the symptoms. All right, so if you flip back over here, so if you have this box checked, you will more than likely be getting a 70% rating. Total occupational and social impairment would be 100, so this is 100, 70, 50, 30, 10, and 0%. This would mean that you have a diagnosis, but the symptoms aren't severe and don't interfere with your life, your occupational or social impairment. We'll skip down here a little bit. Right here in this next section, in section two, is the clinical findings, uh, records reviewed. I would hope so. And they're going to list out all the evidence that was reviewed, you know, VA treatment records, private treatment records. If you're going outside of the VA for healthcare, you would have had to submit that with your claim for them to actually look at it. 
this is where we get in here, the, the recent history. If we're talking about a brand new claim, you've never filed a mental health claim before, they're gonna wanna know about your life. Okay, the reason why they're asking this is because they want to rule out maybe you had a messed up childhood and they're gonna try to pin your mental health symptoms on that event or your upbringing. So keep that in mind whenever you're talking about this stuff. If you think you had a normal life, then say, yeah, I didn't start having problems until after I got out of service. Obviously be truthful. No, that's what they're looking for. They want your occupational educational history to see what's going on. You know, do you have a hard time holding down a job? Do you butt heads with your boss? Stuff like that. Do you have friends? Do you isolate? They really want the full picture. Do you take any medication for your mental health diagnosis? Do you have a problem? Do you get into fights? Public intox? Stuff like that. Substance abuse history. Okay, if you tell them you're an alcoholic or you are a drug abuser, what are some symptoms that come from that stuff? Well, alcohol is a depressant. It's a downer. So if you tell them that you drink a 30-pack every night, they're going to say, okay, your depression symptoms is because of your drinking. Unless you can prove that your alcohol abuse is related to your service, maybe that's a symptom of PTSD, then that's fine, but that's a whole different avenue. Just know what they're looking for when you go into these CNP exams. So you have to meet all of this criteria in order to get service connected for PTSD. You have to have an exposure to, to actual or threatened a death, a serious injury, sexual violation, in one or more of the following ways. You have to fall within these three top boxes. If this gets clicked right here, no criteria met, you're not going to get service connected for PTSD. But like I talked about earlier in the video, if you do have multiple diagnosis, whether it be depression or anxiety, they can still service connect you with that route. But if you don't meet all this criteria for PTSD, you won't get that. Criteria B, presence of one or more of the following intrusion symptoms associated with traumatic event. You know, do you have distressing memories? Do you get daydream? Do you, have, do you have bad nightmares, recurring nightmares of the incident that happened to you in service? Let's talk about criteria C. It talks about persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the event be beginning after traumatic events occurred. So you have to have some of this other one. Maybe you avoid crowds. Maybe you avoid doing certain things because it causes memories to surface from your stressor. So you avoid those places. Maybe you don't like crowds because you associate crowds with a bad incident that happened. Criteria D, negative alterations in cognitive and mood associated with the traumatic events beginning or worsening after the traumatic event. This is like, remember I was telling you, they're, they're gonna look at, okay, is this service connected? Were you experiencing this beforehand or did it happen after you your stressor happened in service? This is, do you have a memory problem? You know, Do you have inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic events? But maybe you don't specifically remember every th detail that happened, that's your brain protecting you from that stuff so it blocks it out. And then all these other ones right here. All this other criteria and it just keeps on going I'm not, i won't go through it all but you can keep on reading down that here and then let this is actually where your ratings come from okay this is listing out all of your symptoms so all of these symptoms are found within that 38 cfr so we'll flip back over here remember we got to right here it lists out all of the symptoms that are found within the 70 percent rating so keep in mind you don't have to have every single one of these symptoms in the 70 percent rating block to actually get a 70% rating. You just have to have more found within this block than in any of the others. The first one they list here is suicidal ideation. And whenever it comes to this stuff, I know it's uncomfortable talking about, but you really need to be open with the CNP examiner. You're likely never have to see this person again. And this is the most important part of your entire claims process is your CNP exam and reporting these symptoms and having examples of how it affects you in your life. Because if they ask you, do you have suicidal ideation? You may say, yes, I do. And they're gonna ask you for an example. Well, your example of forced suicidal ideation might be that you involuntarily have thoughts coming to you saying that people around you may be better off if you weren't there anymore or if you were in the picture. So you start to idolize that, that thought. Now you don't have plans of ever doing it, but it just, intrusive thoughts come and it is what it is you just keep driving on that alone is not normal it's not normal behavior okay but if that happens to you you need to be able to talk to the cmp examiner about this next one obsessional rituals which interfere with routine activities so i have a really good example i have a really good friend who has ptsd rated at this and he cannot go to sleep at night until he sweeps his house three times He's got to check all of his doors, make sure all of his doors are locked before he goes to bed. And he has a thing with the oven. 
he has to make sure the oven does, the oven is actually turned off because he's worried about something happening while he's asleep. That interferes with routine activities. If you're married, you have a significant other, they're going to wonder what the heck's going on. They're, they're going to bed. Maybe they've been in bed for 15 minutes and you're still sweeping around the house. That's not normal. That would fall within that 70% rating. Speech intermittent, intermittently illogical. This just means you just ramble a lot and maybe you don't make sense to people. Like I said, all of these don't have to apply to you in order to get a 70%, but it does have to be quite a few of these. So it talks about obscure or irrelevant. That's talking about the speech. Near continuous panic or depression affecting the ability to function independently. That's pretty self-explanatory. But with a lot of this stuff, Google these symptoms and dig into it because they're going to have definitions and maybe you just need to hear it explained to you one way. And then that way, like I said, you can come back and with your own example on how it's affected you, right? Impaired impulse control, such as unprovoked irritability with periods of violence. Let's say the first example that comes to mind is maybe you have road rage. Maybe you were a driver while you were in, in the military and you have zero chill when it comes to driving. You were always taught, you know, if you're in a convoy, no one cuts you off. Maybe that happened to you one day while you're going to the grocery store or something and you completely gave this person the bird or something like that and, and you wanted to hunt them down. Once again, not normal. If anyone else is in the vehicle with you, I guarantee they're going to be like, Jesus, what's wrong with this person? You know, not normal behavior. Make sure you report that. Spatial disorientation, to me, that means that you just have no sense of direction. You have no idea where you're at. Maybe you have to use GPS. Once again, Google. Neglect of personal appearance and hygiene. Maybe you don't shower every day. Maybe you're the depression. You know, a lot of people have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, or they just don't care how they look. They put on a ball cap, some sweatpants, and go about their day, and they can't remember the last time they, they showered. I know it's weird to talk about, but a lot of people go through this stuff. And if it's you, make sure you're talking about it. Uh, difficulty in adapting to stressful circumstances, including work or work-like settings. Maybe you cannot do, you can't work. Any amount of stress, you fold, or maybe you're the aggressive type where you get stressed out and you get angry. Maybe you like to have control over the situations. That could be you too. Come up with an example. Inability to establish and maintain effective relationships. Maybe you isolate. Maybe you make videos on the internet. You don't like talking to people in the real world. It can, it can look different for other people. Maybe uh, you're married and your only friend is your wife. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. So that, that could be your instance for that. Behavioral observations. They're watching you when you go to these CNP exams. And I can remember specifically for me, there's cameras at the front door, down the hallway, all the way to the actual examination room they're they're watching you if you made it this far i got one more nugget for you here i'm unfortunate that this happened but uh i wanted to share something with you that actually happened to me in my personal cmp exam and something else that you want to look out for when i was at my cmp exam my very first cmp exam after they took all my information this lady holds up one of these colorblind tests okay she looked at me and she said people with ptsd will not see the number six okay Think about the mind game there. If you truly are color colorblind, you know, maybe you don't see that. I know I have PTSD. I've been to the doctor. I can clearly see that there's a six in this picture. But what she was trying to do is trying to discredit me. Okay. If she said if some someone with PTSD won't be able to see this number, so they're trying to get you. Okay. I said yes, I can see a number six there. She put down the card and the examination went on. So they're gonna they they like to play games. They're trying to discredit you and get you for malingering. So whenever you go to these CMP exams, be completely truthful. Don't get caught lying. Nothing like that. I just wanted to share that nugget there. And another one here too. Another test that didn't happen to me that I heard of a of good friend happening. They went to the CMP exam. They were claiming anxiety and PTSD. Veteran walks in the room and there's a chair in the middle of the room with the back to the door. The veteran pretty much had to walk through the door, walk around the chair, and sit down. People with hypervigilance or anxiety, PTSD, they generally don't like to have backs to a door. That was another test. So if someone who potentially had PTSD or really bad anxiety, hypervigilance, they're looking to see if you move that chair out of the way or you face it towards the door so you can actually see what's going on. So it's unfortunate that they play these games, but I know that there's bad apples and everything, so there's gonna be people malingering, but just keep that in mind. I hope you got some value out of this video here. One other thing I wanted to talk about here, I do have free personal statement templates 
at the link in the description below. If you want to check those out, you just have to put in your email. That way it automatically sends it to you. And yeah, let me know down in the comment what you guys think about these stories. That's all for this one. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks.